Hi and welcome to the Homeopathy Health Show. I'm Atik Ahmad Bhatti, a fourth generation homeopath with over 25 years of professional experience and practice in this field of healing. The Homeopathy Health Show is the online voice of homeopathy around the world, promoting and raising awareness of this truly unique complementary system of healing, which is suitable for all ages, young and old. Every week, I invite guests from the world of homeopathy to come and share their experiences, their work, offer insights, and essentially talk all things homeopathy. Why not visit www.liketreatslike.co.uk and click on the radio and podcast button to listen to the latest episodes. So let's begin today's show here on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. Hi and welcome to another episode of the Homeopathy Health Podcast here on UK Health Radio. I hope you've had a pleasant week and as always I hope and pray you and your loved ones are in good health and certainly may it remain that way. Now in today's show I'm delighted to be speaking to Tanya Aroha Twentyman who joins me from New Zealand. Tanya is a New Zealand based homeopath and consciousness coach with over 15 years experience in clinical practice. She has taught at the College of Natural Health and Homeopathy and spent four years in a co-project management role setting up a Steiner school on Waiheke Island. She is the mother of four children, all brought up on homeopathy and says mothering is her proudest career highlight. Tanya has a special interest in using homeopathy to empower people to overcome mental and emotional challenges and she passionately believes homeopathy is a powerful tool to help raise the consciousness of humanity. Tanya sees people worldwide over Zoom and in person in her clinics on Waiheke Island and Auckland City. So without further ado, um, Tanya, it's uh, amazing and brilliant to have you on the Homeopathy Health podcast, joining me all the way from Waiheke Island, which is just off New Zealand itself. Thank you, Atik. I was just saying, actually, to Tanya, we were having a a good old uh, catch up just before the recording. And um, I said, it's just brilliant, isn't it? At times like this, I I love technology because um, we are talking to one another. It's the next day, or should I say the next morning for Tanya in uh, on Wahiki Island. And it's uh, late evening for me. But uh, we're talking to each other. We've got the video up as well. And it's literally like we're in the same room. It's just amazing. That is amazing. One thing I didn't mention was years ago, part of my um, job before I came to homeopathy was working in telecommunications. And at that point, you had to, when you you had to set up these lines to go overseas and it would, you know, go up to, out to space and along here and there'd be so much delay. And if anyone had said to us then, you know, one day you'll be videoing and the response will be like that. You know, you'd talk on the phone would satellite up, you'd have to wait, you know, for it to come back. And um, yeah, so the progress we're making is is huge. I remember actually many years ago, uh, my brother gifted me with a, a brand new PC for my third year at university. And I remember using a 14.4K modem, which would literally take ages forever um, to hook up to the internet. And hey, those were the days and and look where we are now. It's just uh, incredible. Yeah. Tanya, I wanted to actually start um, just by asking you about what it's like living on Waiheke Island. I know just before the recording of this podcast today, uh, you actually showed me briefly outside uh, your window. And wow, it's it's basically a, a picture postcard, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yes, it's a very beautiful island. It's about 40 minutes ferry trip into the Hauraki Gulf from Auckland. A lot of people know Auckland in New Zealand. And our main industry here is is wine and olives are, you know, olive oil is quite close behind that. So a lot of people come over for day trips or, you know, we get a huge tourist influx over summer. So, and then over winter, it goes back to a little bit of a sleepy island. It's... um. It's an incredible place to live, actually, because the bird life is phenomenal. We've had a really big project on the island for getting rid of pests. And so 
that means that in the morning, the dawn chorus is just like the Tuis, they're native to New Zealand, and we've got kaka. Also, they're a type of parrot native to New Zealand. So, yeah, you can, and I notice when I go other places, I wake up and orientate myself to the, the birds and the trees, and I'm like, there's no bird song. There's no bird song. So for that, that for me is really noticeable being here. And all the, you know, the beach is a sort of 10 minutes drive anywhere pretty much you can get to a beach. So very blessed to live here. And as I was mentioning before, the the downside, because everywhere has its pluses and minuses, and mm. the downside is that to get off the island, it's always a ferry trip, obviously. So to go to my clinic in town is um, a 40 minute ferry trip, plus a train, plus a bus. Not bad if you want to live in paradise though, hey? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, not bad. And how big is the island, Tanya? Is it is it quite large? I mean, um, is it easy to go around as such? Uh, so I couldn't tell you on kilometres, but to drive around it might take, I don't know, and maybe an hour, 45 mm. minutes to an hour, quite windy roads. Yeah, yeah. And then so there's a little hub down one end, which is sort of residential. And then down the other end, a lot of farmland, a lot of vineyards. Right. And yeah. And a good size population? 8,000 permanent residents. And okay. I think around about 2,000 of those are commuters off the island every day. And then over summer, you're looking, it's up to like 20,000 people coming, a lot, a lot of holiday homes. And right. and again, that's that you know has its own challenges because for local people trying to find accommodation, got a lot of homes that are just shut up for most of the year. So with the influx of tourists, which uh, which must be in the uh, summer months, right uh, during the peak season as such, how how do you find that? How how is that? Yeah, a lot of um hen parties, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stag parties. Yeah, it's interesting because I think people that <clears throat> live here, we tend to just kind of withdraw a little bit while that's happening because it's sort of like a mass influx of people. So, mm. yeah, and um, yeah, we tend to just kind of stick to our own thing and then come out again <laughs> after all the tourists have gone. But it's essential yeah. to the survival of the local businesses, you know, to have this huge tourist population come and to see people enjoying the island I mean it's beautiful but there was um rec recently a, a little news article and someone who'd lived here for a long time said when you you think you're visiting Waiheke and you're coming here but Waiheke visits you you know like it sort of gets into you and into, into part of your being mm. as you can see I'm totally in love with this island already I, I would love to, but I just don't think I, I can handle the flying time over uh, 12 hours, isn't it? So a long, long way. Yeah, it's a long, it's a long way to come to New Zealand at the bottom of the world. But certainly well worth it, I'm quite sure. <laughs> Tanya, I wanted to move to homeopathy and start off really by just asking you, what was your journey? What it, What made you... What attracted you to homeopathy? Now, I know you mentioned before that uh, before homeopathy itself, you were in the field of IT. So uh, do share with us uh, what transpired, how you ended up being a homeopath. Mm. I think, well, for me, I have had a long journey with um, spirituality and personal growth and development. It was always something I was really um, drawn to and passionate about. And I think from the time I was a child, I was incredibly curious. You know, I had this curious mind, um, which sometimes got me into trouble. But, you know, this real curiosity and a real love of the natural world I often feel and did feel as a child really connected when I was in nature. So so I've got four children and with my third, he had quite chronic ear infections. And with my second child, I'd actually been to an anthroposophical doctor. So they're a part of medicine. Um, Rudolf Steiner was an incredible person and came up with um, indications for education, indications for medicine and also biodynamics for farming. And so anthroposophical doctors work with his indications that he 
had for medicine. And it's it's very similar to homeopathy. They use um, a, you know homeopathic remedies, very low doses. So my second son had asthma and had been coughing and coughing, and I took him to an anthroposophical doctor and magic, you know, like no more, it had gone. Mm -hmm. And so I'd started on a journey of my children at a Steiner school and a friend there had said to me, my third son was getting ear infections, chronic ear infections. And they'd said like, you're going to need grommets. And I didn't want to do that. And a friend said to me, why don't you try a homeopath? And I'd never heard of it before. And I was like, what is that? Is that something someone does at home or, you know, what is this? So I took him along and um, we had a few treatments and no more ear infections, not not ever again, you know. And so then I did that thing that everybody does. You take your next child, then your next child, and then you take yourself. And what I experienced was not only for my children did it help with behavioral challenges, you know, um, it's like, oh, this is a bit of a problem at the moment. But for myself, it shifted things at such a deep level and I was like, that would have taken me years of therapy or that would have taken hours of meditation to really shift that. So, you know, it was through experiencing the benefit of it that, again, sparked this curiosity I was talking about before. And so I started my training. And during that time, I also started working for my family homeopath as her personal assistant or practice manager. And she is an amazing homeopath, Nikki Leonard. She trained with Martin Miles and Robert Davidson in the UK before she came to New Zealand. It's a small world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is a small, world. a small world. And she had this way of practicing, which really informs how I practice today. And that is looking for uh, the theme of the, well, I, tend, I call them clients and, and we can talk more about why I use that term, but so, you know, sometimes she would repertorize, but mostly she would give you a remedy there on the spot because she so deeply understood the Materia Medica and really understood the remedy. So I was incredibly blessed to work alongside someone that just had this, you know, in her bones, so to speak. And while I was working for her, she had a big library and I was given the job of indexing the library. And I came across this book. Homeopathy and Human Evolution by Martin Miles. I don't know if you've read it. And I took it home and I just read it from cover to cover. And that, I guess, was this initial, the seeds are being planted for the fact that homeopathy is a tool that can help evolve human consciousness. And um, and that's never left me, that, that passion for that that drive for that. So yeah, then I I um, studied and started my own practice, moved from where I was at the time to Auckland and mm. yeah, have never looked back since. But I think the thing is with homeopathy, in a way it's it chooses you. It's a choiceless choice, you know, and it becomes so much a part of your being and you look back and you think, wow, this was always how I viewed the world. This was this is a part, it's not a profession that happens over here. It's it's an embodiment of how you see the world, how you live in life, you know, that very holistic way of everything's interconnected. We're not just a body and a mind and a soul over there somewhere. We are this one being with all of these different facets. You know, this this if you're going to be a good practitioner, you need to also equally be going to your own homeopath, working on your own things, really experience the depth of where these remedies can go, what they can do, what they can shift. And um, and that compassion for humanity also is about compassion for ourselves, that we are human beings, that you know, it's that humility that we will make mistakes, we're not perfect we are also doing this journey. And then with your clients, and the reason why I like to call them clients is because I, and it's not really, even that word's not quite right, but because for me, I feel like now we're moving into a time where it's not the guru or the homeopath or the doctor or whatever up there. It's that we are equal souls walking this path and it just so happens that in this setting I have these skills and knowledge 
that can help this other person. But my passion is about empowering them. Like you were saying in ancient times, you know, we had the wisdom, what I call the wisdom within. So for me, it's about working with someone to bring them back to this wisdom place within that then they can make these autonomous decisions. So I guess I'm kind of quite lanthanide in that way. You know, it's about this sort of autonomy and, and, you know, not wanting this hierarchy. And I see parenting the same, you know, I've been through quite a journey with my parenting and, you know, my children are my, some of my biggest teachers for sure. And I see it that, in this lifetime, our souls are equal, but in this lifetime, they've chosen me to be their parent. So often when I'm seeing other parents, um, there's been a big shift in, in parenting and a lot of new age kind of parenting where you give the child a lot of choices. And and I see a lot of, you know, I get a lot of children that are anxious and overwhelmed. And I use a lot of analogies in my practice. And so one analogy I use is like, you're the parent you're the captain of the ship and you imagine if you're at sea and and there's a storm and the captain turns around and says to you so you know should we put the sails up or should we take the sails down or should we go left or should we go right and what do you think and if you're a child that's a bit like well you know I don't know it, it it's quite destabilizing so again it's this thing of like knowing at a deeper level you're equal but in this situation, they've chosen you as the parent. So it's your job to take the lead. And obviously that changes with time. You know, there's more and more freedom and autonomy given. But um, so with clients, it's the same thing. What I really like to do after a session is I send an email and send resources. And some of those won't be homeopathic. It might be a link to a meditation or something to do with neuroscience to read or something else because I think it's important that we empower people and don't create a relationship of dependency and the word patient for me sort of has this thing of like well I've got all the answers but you know there's so I've learned so much off my clients and some of them have a lot more wisdom than I have and I'm like wow how you know you're absolutely right as far as patients are concerned and I learn so much from from my patients and uh, sometimes once you've spoken to them you realize what they've been through and if you hadn't you wouldn't know and you, you wouldn't be privy to that and it's amazing to see their humility or the fact that they've kept it to themselves and they're continuing you know with life uh, despite all the pain. And it's such a privilege to hear someone's story or tapestry of their life and all the threads that have gone into mm. making this per this cloak that they wear, this, you know, this human experience that they're having. And I just think it's such an honor and, and so touching to some people, you know, sometimes it's quite hard, you know, your eyes might well up with tears, you hear someone share their story and you think, I have no way to understand why this person has needed to go through so much suffering. You know, I don't have a way to conceptualize that. I don't understand that. But yet it is. And here's this person sitting before me, a good human being, a beautiful human being. And for me, the case taking, I love case taking. <laughs> I see it as a dance, you know, of like, it's, it's home. It really is homeopathic. It's, you know, you adjust your case taking to who's in front of you. So it's that individualization that, that we talk about in homeopathy and, you know, how you take a case with a 80 year old woman would be different than a 15 year old boy, or, you know, we, we do that dance, we adapt our style so that we get the information that we need. And, and sometimes it's just like, there's no words that I can say to what that person's just shared, but just share a profound stillness of, of being with, you know, that pain and suffering and then thinking what an incredible human being you are, that here you are living life, a good person, and yet you've been through so much. So, you know, it's, it is really a profound privilege to be able to be that person of trust that someone says, I've never told anyone this before. 
or I didn't know this was there. And for me, when we can start helping people see that fabric that's been woven of their life, then we can start going after a period of time. Okay, so let's be conscious about how we weave this fabric. What do you want to change? And this is the bit that excites me about homeopathy is that we can use remedies to evolve consciousness, to shift those things. I mean, we know that with the miasms, right? When we use the nosodes, that mm. in a way we are evol- we are changing karma or evolving consciousness by getting rid of, um, you know, what we've brought with us. So, yeah, my mind's going off into lots of different tangents. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop there. <laughs> it's fascinating. No, you must carry on, please, please. Well, what I was going to say is part of the anthroposophical medicine, certainly at the time that I was introduced to it, is uh, they talk a lot about fevers and the importance of fevers for children. And that when a child has a fever, they see it as the opportunity for the child to rearrange the vehicle, the physical body. Um, and to burn off what's inherited. So what I was thinking, I was making this connection between how we use the nosodes and how they view fevers. So for my own children, um, and I certainly teach mothers this, of course, it's not it's not like you do nothing. It's the middle path, always the middle path. So, you know, absolutely watch the child, see how they are, you know, and use the remedies and get medical help if you need it. But don't just suppress it because if we allow the child to go through a fever, there's so much that is burnt off for if, you, if you subscribe to that point of view. And, and you will see often after a fever, there's a real leap in the child's development, something that they weren't quite doing before, now they can do. So it, the fever helps rearrange the vehicle so that they can take up what their life destiny is, you know, not so much being overloaded with. Then I think if you use homeopathic remedies, what I've often noticed is um, people manifest in acute to get a remedy they've needed for a long time. And that's a beautiful thing to witness. So it's like, ah, that remedy, I would have never thought about that for that child that I've been seeing, but now it's come up or that adult, but fevers, you know, tend to happen a lot in children. The other thing is I think it's we we um we've lost the art of nursing. And I think it's a really beautiful thing to be with your child when they're sick, to uh again be the captain of the ship. Like uh, you know, I say to my daughter, um, your body's strong and healthy, your body's strong and healthy. So to really impart in them, you, your body knows what it's doing, it has its own wisdom within, it can fight this. So I think the message that the child learns at a subconscious level is something comes towards me and I have the fire to meet it. I have a boundary, that's the immune system, you know, and so I've gone off on a tangent, but um, I think fevers are something to be um, celebrated. Of course, we would look at it if the child's continuously getting a fever or again, you know, in homeopathy, we look at the child that never gets a fever. It's like, what's going on? Is it, is are they so is their vital force so suppressed they can't meet what comes with fire? So I think fevers are one way of building physical resilience as long as they're managed well. And the other thing I believe is that when the child is fevering, they're quite wide open. So I I say to mums, don't put them on technology, like read books rest be with them and of course we all live busy lives and it's easy just to plug them in but just be aware of what comes into their realm when they're working through a fever and and that beautiful reassurance of you've got this you know your body's strong and healthy your body is strong and healthy I think that's a much different picture than getting really really anxious and of course you know there's times when you do as a parent because you're a bit like oh the fever's getting pretty high but again, with the homeopathic remedies, and you'll know the same, it's like, don't just look at the thermometer because you'll give a really good remedy. The child gets up in place, they've still got a fever, but they're managing it really well, or they go and have a nice restful sleep, whereas before they were thrashing around. So look to the disposition of the child, don't look to the thermometer of, oh, the fever's come crashing down. No, it hasn't, but the child's managing it so much better. 
What you've said there is is testament not only to homeopathy but also to the parents, parents specifically who use homeopathy at home for everyday common ailments, for example, which they can self uh, prescribe for. Because what you've got nowadays is, you know, we live Tanya in, in this world, don't we, where the first sign of an illness, let's take fever for an example, and if it's a child, there's this panic and you have to call the GP or you have to go to the pharmacist and, and get whatever is available to somehow bring this fever down. And um, it can also lead to calling the emergency services or even ending up in A&E. Whereas homeopathy itself empowers the parents themselves to be able to prescribe, to be able to be calm in such a situation. Of course, certainly nobody wants to see their child unwell. And a fever is, 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 of course, it's naturally, it's worrying. But the beauty of homeopathy here also comes into play that because of this empowerment, because of this calm, uh, one is able to, let's say for an example here, one is able to say, okay, the fever is, is spiking and you've got a flushed face and so forth and belladonna 200 or 30 or whatever it is that's needed at that time as far as potency. But as far as the remedy, you know, belladonna and it's taken at such and such intervals and there is control there and there is calm and, there's, and, and there is no panic. And that's a, a beautiful space to be in. And and that's where, you know, when you've had that experience and you've used the remedies, you, you just know you don't need to convince anybody. And it's like, well, if the remedy's not working, it's because I haven't I haven't read that right. You know, it's not because homeopathy doesn't work, it's because I haven't been still enough inside to see it, or the picture's a bit muddly, or um yeah, but so it's it's that personal experience of I've seen this work, I've experienced it to work. and um, mm. Now, Tanya, I know your family use homeopathy, and um, like my family, and I'm, I'm quite sure, like any family who has a homeopath or a practitioner of homeopathy. So do share uh, that journey and uh, any stories that you have. So um, my children were brought up on homeopathy and, um, you know, I think a couple of them might have had antibiotics a couple of times, possibly. Yeah, and so I have to say the one remedy I wouldn't do without is Arnica. I've got, um, I, you know, all my children were incredibly active. My daughter rides horses and I just... Uh, it's always in my pocket the amount of times she's fallen off and I'm just like take this and she does the classic thing of like I'm all right leave me alone you know I don't need anything and so now I've said to her look even if you're saying that I'm going to give you Annika anyway because that's part of the picture that you need Annika that you think you're okay when you're clearly not yeah so they've grown up on homeopathy they had their I took them to the homeopath they've had their own homeopath to go to and and now the adults you know they obviously have their own journey make their own decisions find their own way so um yeah and and I have my own homeopath that I go to and keep doing that inner work of of what needs to be shifted what's a challenge what do I need to work through and find that, you know, really valuable, especially supportive in my practice, because, you know, there's a bit of sort of mentoring that goes on too with with my own homeopath, but it just supports me and helps me. It's so important, isn't it, to for a homeopath to actually go to another homeopath rather than uh, self-prescribe or self-medicate, because, uh, well, I'm a perfect example. I'm, I'm terrible at uh, taking remedies myself as far as which remedy I need as such. I'm so biased. It's unbelievable. <laughs> we are all of the remedies. We are all, we have all of the remedies within. We could be any remedy. I really believe that. And when, and then that takes away so much judgment about, ah, oh, could I be a lycoponium? Could I be a whatever. And when we're taught the remedies, we're taught the extremes of them. And just over the years, you know, you learn that that's one aspect, but I think that it's a spectrum and it's like, yes, yeah, sometimes some people are at the extreme of that remedy and, and will show that way, but most often not because we're social creatures. So, you know, 
or just that we haven't been pushed that far. So I think when you understand that you can be any remedy within, but also then the other side of that is that you pick up a book and you're like, yeah, that that one, ma- oh no, that one matches. No, I could also be that one. And then you need your homeopath to see it very clearly. This is This is the one that you need. So I find that really valuable. I'll tell you a nice story here. Uh, I woke up um, with some pain around my right knee joint and uh, kept thinking about it for a couple of days. So should I take this or should I take that? Which one will work? And then on day three, I thought, forget this, you know. And I said, the remedy is causticum. And I went, made causticum 1M and took two doses. Knee is absolutely fine. So it is possible, of course, for acute ailments, certainly to to self-prescribe as far as a homeopath is concerned. But um, I've also found that it's the remedy that actually pops in your head immediately that is the one that's correct. And human nature is always you just, oh, maybe you think again and you think, let me just check. Is it that one? Is it this one? Is it something else? I remember years ago, Jan Scholten came when he'd first done the Lanthanides um, book and he came to New Zealand and did a little conference. And I remember him saying the same thing, like, oh, I use this remedy. It's it's not in the books anywhere for this, but it completely, you know, cured this person. Um, and, you know, that again planted this little seed of like, oh, wow, because at the time I was still a student. Oh, oh, so you don't, it doesn't have to be written in the Materia Medica for this. So if you look at the overall picture of the person, if it's enough of a fit, so much will resolve itself, even like you say, if it's not in the Materia Medica for that particular condition. And it doesn't have to be. And and that's the beauty, isn't it, of homeopathy itself. And of course, of homeopaths. Every homeopath is an artist and they paint their own picture or portrait and they all, the end result rather is that, you know, they all, they all come out beautiful. Tanya, how is your uh, clinic going along? Because I know that you have, of course, the clinic on Waiheke Island and you also have a a clinic on Auckland City, in Auckland City rather, on mainland uh, New Zealand. Yeah, so I've got a little clinic um, at from my home on Waiheke Island, and then I go into Auckland City a couple of times a week and have clinics in there. So um, it's a it's a variation of mostly, actually, interestingly enough, I see adults, uh, and I think that's because I have this passion um, for working very strongly with the mental and emotional aspects of people. So. Um, yeah, and, and it's mostly women, even though I see men. It tends to be women that go and get the help before, you know, the crisis happens and then the guys, I'm generalising here, so sorry, blokes. But, you know, then when it's like the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff kind of thing. Um, yeah, so so that's that's how, I, it's, it's, you know, it's different. It changes from week to week. Some weeks you have like, oh, I've mostly seen children this week and then other weeks oh, I've mostly seen adults in the city, it tends to be mostly adults. And I would say the suffering that people are experiencing is similar, whether you're on Waiheke or in the city, you know, wherever you live, you have to face yourself eventually. And in fact, one thing I would say about the island is maybe that's more pronounced because there's not the distractions of the city. You know, you're on an island, it's it has an energy that kind of, you know, yeah, it makes you have to face yourself because there's not a lot of distractions. There's the beaches and things, but that's, that's yeah, mostly it is people with mental and emotional things like burnout, stress, depression, anxiety, rather than really physically based. And I think it's just, it's probably just because that's the area that I'm incredibly comfortable in. Um, I don't mind those kind of intense conversations or working in that very deep way or sometimes it's a light way with people. Tanya this takes me on to a very beautiful quote which I've taken from yourself from your website and this is on uh, your website um, holistichomeopathy.nz nz being for New Zealand and and this quote which is actually I suppose it this is the objective this is your objective reads 
I help people who struggle with burnout, stress, trauma, depression and anxiety to feel more ease, calm and joy. I do love that because it's um it's so true and it's a wonderful objective of course like all homeopaths that's that is indeed our objective but the fact that you've um specifically honed in on being calm and bringing joy that in itself is is, is very inspiring. Truly speaking there isn't enough joy in the world is there it's uh, it's it's almost depleted and i think that's because we have lost our connection with the soul you know or or and or you could use different terms for that you know our connection with the natural world for example or and so if we're losing joy in life i think it's because there's a, a missing connection to to a deeper meaning to a deeper purpose and um you know in consultations i often joke with people that i make everybody cry you know because people always cry and then they're like oh i'm sorry i'm sorry I'm like it's a, it's all right i make everybody cry but equally you know we have we have some laughter it's like you find something that you can just laugh about um and to bring that lightness and and as we know the remedies also bring lightness especially the remedies that have so much darkness have also the ability to bring so much light. And actually, as you were saying that, I, I um, are you familiar with this wondrous order book by Makiel Yakur on the plants? Amazing. She has. It's an amazing book. But what? But with reference to that, is is I think it's a Jungian kind of style of of following the development of the human being from the baby who's dependent to, you know, and and so the plants are put into this order. This is my very rudimentary understanding of it. Um, And as you were saying that, I'm like, maybe humanity, probably not the world because I think nature's doing its own thing, but humanity is also going through this developmental stage and maybe we're really going through a very metarinum psychotic stage at the moment which is why there is all this violence and and darkness and and secret you know secrets that are hidden and and maybe we go through as individuals our own sort of you know process but the humanity is also evolving so out of the darkness into the light thank you so much tanya there's still so much to talk about isn't it but uh, i hope later in the year you can join me again and uh, we can talk some more as as far as uh, the wealth of experience that you that you have but um i wanted to move on to something light hearted now some questions for you something i've asked everybody actually um and the results are very 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 funny sometimes uh, sometimes just very interesting to know anyhow uh, what is your favorite remedy or remedies and if it's remedies, then uh, you have a maximum of three. Ah, oh, that's so <laughs> cool. How could you do that to me? <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's like... I think you mentioned one already, didn't you? I mean, and then there's the favourite remedies for you and your family and then the favourite remedies that may be yeah. in your practice. But um, obviously, Annika, if anyone's listening to this that that isn't familiar with homeopathy, Annika is, you know, your best friend if someone slips over I mean just you know if in doubt give Annika kind of like it's probably naughty that I say that but you know amazing for shock amazing Mm. for bruising bleeding burns any of that it's it's just such a great remedy and maybe I say that because our family's quite active but you know you might be out and someone slips over and you know ask them if they want homeopathy and, and a little bit of Annika the other remedy I really love is actually aconite I think we we don't understand the depth of aconite and it's often just given as this like oh you know if when they first get a fever or someone first gets sick give aconite but I've used it for people um, that have had drug recreational drug experiences and gotten stuck in between all I can say is it's kind of in between worlds it's like and it's a very fearful scary place to be because there's enough awareness to know that they're not in this world or in the other and so if you've got someone that's you know 
mostly it ten, tends to be marijuana, but with, you know, whatever else they're taking, it will help bring them back into the body and calm that nervous system down. A lot of people don't realize that it's a really good remedy for the liver where there's been a lot of fear and fright. And so I think, yeah, we need to, sometimes with these acute remedies, they can be amazing constitutional remedies mm. as well. The third, mm. I just, I really, I don't know if I could choose, but I think in my practice, I I mean, nature muir, obviously everybody has a bit of nature muir in them. Everybody has some ignatia in them. But I do think in practice, through uh, the nose odes, I mean, those remedies that actually have a lot of darkness in them, like I mm. said, can bring a lot of light because it's just, um, it is really the delusion of the mind that we are separate. And um, those kind of, you know, belladonna and stramonium and those kind of, you know, remedies that anacardium that have some dark element to them can bring so much lightness so but to choose three remedies that's that's incredibly difficult mm. well thank you for that very interesting indeed now uh next question uh, favorite book or books and again if it's three uh rather <laughs> i just told you how many it was there but, <laughs> but if if it's more than one then it's three I know it's a difficult question, but um, you have actually mentioned uh, a few, haven't you, in the podcast today? Philosophy books, which you can tell that I love, and then the practical books. And this is what I love about homeopathy, because it's incredibly practical. I mean, I know today I've talked probably a bit more esoterically or because I love philosophy, but it's inc homeopathy is just so beautifully practical as well. For Mulan, I would not be without for Mulan. Both I've got on my desk, Prisma and the Concordant. Um, love those, you know, and, and I, I'm a, I just don't know how do these people get time to, it's incredible. I've exchanged uh, several emails with uh, Franz and I know that uh, he's very busy working on his next title, which is uh, going to be called Millifolium. And that's coming out later this year. So I know that he's um, totally, all his time as such, he's being taken up. Uh, just uh, just by doing that. Then um, desktop companion, Roger Morrison, as a therapeutics. Mm. That I just, yes. <laughs> oh, yours looks in such good condition. Um, then the third one, you again, it's like I get to the third and I'm like, oh, do I have to choose between one and the other? Because Farrakh Master has... Um, done a really good book on children's remedies and I've used it so much the cover's now fallen off but mm. this beautiful wondrous order by Mikhail Yakir on the plants is you know again I don't know how people have time to to think that deeply write so much information but I think the beautiful thing is the plants you know, maybe just because they're plants and the way they are, I'd, I I struggled to really get around some of the more unusual ones, you know, not like the minerals that are structural. They're easy or the animals are so easy to see and understand, but the plants are a bit more. And there's just so much detail in that book. So um, often if I'm thinking a plant and I want a bit more juice on it, then I'll go into her book and have a look. It's it's such a gift to be able to to write, and let's just take that example that you've just mentioned. It's just um, amazing to be able to write about a, a plant or the characteristics of a plant. That's that's not easy. I mean, that that's a tough cookie, isn't it? I mean, that's not easy at all. You're not writing about somebody you know. You're writing about a plant. So, I mean, where do you start? So much time, research and dedication is needed to to compile such books. And we know that it, it surely, I mean, it takes thousands of hours to put something like that together. Exemplary dedication and commitment, of course, goes uh, along the way. And, uh, and no wonder, you know, it's called wondrous because that process, Tanya, is um, is wondrous itself, isn't it? Yeah, and she's put them into this table similar to Jan Scholten did with the minerals. You know, it's a it's a slightly different philosophy, 
slightly, but it still is the development of the human being. So yeah, similar, um, you know, how he has in the, in the periodic table that stage 10 is the highest and, you know, so yeah, it's a very similar thing. Be- beautiful book, color photos. Honestly, it's worth its weight in gold. It's a, it's, and again, it, and mine's been so well used. It's now got seller tape on it. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's good. That means it's it's being used or it has been used extensively. So that can only be a good thing, as long as the tape sticks, of course. <laughs> Tania, it's been amazing having you on, on the podcast today. And uh, I, I just uh, really, really, really good. So thank you so much for taking the time out and also being available so, so early in the morning. I, I suppose as the I, I'm still well, as the Beatles would say, I, I'm still in, in, in yesterday, and uh, you're certainly uh, well ahead of me. I'm truly humbled. Thank you so, so much. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed our time. It's been great. I do hope you've enjoyed the Homeopathy Health Show here on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. Tune in next time for more things homeopathy, interviews, and segments on the healing possibilities that homeopathy can bring you. And don't forget to visit UK Health Radio online at www.ukhealthradio.com to see the many other amazing shows available to listen live and on demand. Or why not download the app from the iOS and Android stores. Until next time, stay safe and take care.